Williams is one of the most historic Formula One teams still around today, and they have the hardware to prove it. 16 total championships, 9 constructors championships, 7 drivers championships. This comes as a result of 114 wins, 312 podiums, 129 poles, 3,561 points. But looking back through recent history, would you have ever guessed it? One of the most common questions I get is what happened to Williams, and this needed to be comprehensively addressed once and for all. Many people call Williams' fall a fall from grace, but over the last few months preparing this, I've noticed that it's more of a systematic failure. Ironically, they're blinded by their own success and crippled by loss. Over their long history in Formula 1, they've had a habit of losing valuable pieces of the team that were vital to success like top talent or top engines like Honda and BMW. But even further, the fundamental reason for their latest form stems from their failure to adapt. The objective is, by the end of the video, you'll form a strong conclusion on whether that's inherently such a bad thing or not. But more than anything, just enjoy the story as we delve deep into the archives and dust off some of the best parts of Formula 1. Chapter 1. Planning the Seed Williams has always been fiercely independent. Nothing really has changed, for better or for worse. Every person I've seen that touches on the roots and origins of Williams always starts in 1977, but I disagree totally. If you want to truly understand this team, we have to start with Frank. This takes us back an entire decade earlier, all the way to 1968. The story begins intertwined with another Formula One legend in his own right, none other than Jack Brabham the only man to ever drive his own Formula 1 car and win a Constructors' Championship doing it. Frank was a recently retired F3 driver who went the Carroll Shelby route and began entering his own drivers. Frank took on his first driver, his flatmate, a driver named Courage, and he backed him in the 1968 run in Formula 2. After a relatively successful 68 campaign, they armed themselves with a Brabham BT-26A, bought from Jack himself. The story goes that Brabham had initially allowed the purchase to proceed with the understanding that Courage would be at the wheel competing in the Tasman Cup, or that Frank might drop a 5.0 liter engine in it and they might race Formula 5000. Whatever the original agreement was, Frank found himself on the Formula 1 grid. That season in 69 had its reliability issues, sure, but it was truly remarkable for such a grassroots underdog campaign, with Courage getting second place at both Monaco and the U.S. Grand Prix. It was enough to get people's attention. This included the likes of Gianpaolo Dallara, the former Ferrari and Maserati man as chief designer of the latter and future founder of Dallara. Armed with passion and a very close bond with his driver, Frank and the Dallara chassis took on the grid, but the setbacks began to mount as the car struggled with unreliability. Fortunes would only continue to sink, and unfortunately, the unthinkable happened, and Frank lost his close friend and driver. Many people speculate that a lot of the heartache that is seen in this chapter of Frank's life, this specific incident in particular, is a lot of the reasons why sometimes Frank can be distant towards some of his drivers in the paddock. But Frank persisted. Really, it was his only option, and the least to honor courage. The first fully branded Frank Williams piece of machinery didn't appear until 1975, when the FW04 became the first chassis to carry the name. But Frank struggled to replicate those results from that initial 1969 season. Naturally, this put the team in financial hardship as results are needed to secure future funding. He had tried to do it all from scratch, limiting the amount of control he had to give out in exchange for money to be invested in his race team. But if it came down to cozying up next to someone with cash or his team dying, he would choose the former, which is precisely what he did in 1975 when Walter Wolf, more businessman and investor at heart than racing enthusiast, bought a majority stake in Frank Williams racing cars. What should have, and likely did, catch Frank's eyes was that he also simultaneously was snatching up the remains of fallen F1 teams like Hesketh and Embassy Hill. But it didn't bother Frank much, as he was still retained as racing manager of his own team, despite the majority ownership going to someone else. The investment didn't yield much in the way of an overwhelmingly strong contender. This pattern persisted through the 1976 season, and then Frank was hit with another bombshell. There would be more loss to the team, but this time not in the form of a driver. It was Frank. Walter Wolf felt he had no choice but to shake things up. The next few decisions, I believe, rocked Frank Williams to the core and ultimately what drives a core part of the issue of what modern day Williams seems to face now, and their intense protection of their name and their assets. So Walter Wolf fired Frank Williams from the racing manager role on his own team and replaced him with Peter Bohr, who would oversaw two championships over at Lotus. Frank would take his top talent and immediately form Williams Grand Prix Engineering. This included Patrick Head, who had only joined the team in 1975. Head came on as the minority partner and owning the technical side, splitting the team 70-30. What made all this even worse to a degree was that Wolf achieved relative success despite a lackluster car at the hands of, in my opinion, one of the most naturally gifted drivers to grace Formula 1, future Ferrari man and world champion Jody Schechter. The new outfit's first year placed fourth as a constructor with three wins, six podiums, and Jody second only to Niki Lauda. Despite Schechter's brilliance for Wolf racing in that year, he was not able to replicate this. The 78 season saw Jody finish 7th and the team finish 5th. 
When Ferrari finally noticed Jody and scooped him up in the 1979 season, Wolf threw money at the problem, not engineering. Not even with the solid lineup of James Hunt and Keki Rosberg could Wolf salvage the team. They managed zero points as a constructor that year, and in the most abysmal fashion possible, retired from 80% of the races they entered. Frank Williams painfully had to watch a team he built with his bare hands get flushed down the drain and end up folding into another team. All the while, Wolf would simply move on to his other interests, and all of Frank's work would be washed away with history. All of this started with the passion, the dream that he shared with his close friend and original driver. So you've got to think that, at least in those early days, carrying on was as much for courage as it was for Frank. The good news was that Williams Grand Prix Engineering was officially up and running and operating a Formula One car by the 1977 season. Frank's persistence would finally begin to pay off, and things would begin to go his way and the team's way for once. Chapter 2. A Taste of the Good Life the 1979 season for Frank was their first splash into Formula 1 as a real challenger. For the first four rounds, the team would run a non-ground effects car, and then the FW07 would make its debut in Spain. The two drivers of that season were Alan Jones and Clay Recazzoni, with Jones retiring four of his first five and Recazzoni retiring his first two, but then rebounded for P2, P6, and then at long last gave the Williams team their first of many wins to come at Silverstone Round 9. Despite early reliability issues of the FW07, the team began to sort things out and the car won the majority of the final rounds of the 1979 season. Much of the advanced technology and mounting of the ground effects was done by designer Frank Durney. He was the wonderkin who designed Heska's final car, the 308E, while only 26 years old. The critical change he unlocked can be pinpointed to the successful implementation of a system that forced the skirts to be touching the grounds throughout the entirety of the drive. When the flexible skirts began to connect with the track, ground effect suction took over and held the car down, pushing the piston deeper into the reservoir. This made the diagonal rams extend further. While building on existing principles, the work he was doing on aerodynamics was revolutionary, and he also had an eye for talent. He hired an early machinist without a degree, but it was clear that his intellectual capacity and curiosity was one of the highest he's ever come across. His name was none other than Ross Braun. With Braun and a couple others reporting directly to Derny, they formed a small but powerful team that would revolutionize the Williams car and its aerodynamics. And this won't be the only time they end up working together. After pulling that 1979 car together, the team managed to finish second, only behind Jody Schechter's Ferrari. It was clear to Frank and the entirety of Formula One that Jones was an obvious champion lying in wait. The 1980 and 1981 season delivered on the momentum of the 79 season and took back the Constructors' Championship. Williams would also get their first double championship in 1980, as Jones brought back the driver's title for Frank for the first time. Overall, the FW07 was proof that Williams was a real force, and the team had the tools to win. It achieved 15 wins, 300 points, the 1980s driver's title, the 1980s constructor's title, the 1981s constructor's title. The secret behind the FW07's effectiveness was it was very closely based on the design seen in the Lotus 79, leveraging those ground effects aerodynamics. Making use of these mechanics were originally inspired by Colin Chapman. The ground effects experiment showed signs of a successful integration thanks to Chapman's Lotus 78 car. The concept itself was that of Chapman's, but it hadn't really been designed fully for a Formula 1 vehicle until he hired Tony Rudd and Peter Wright to advance the concept into the Lotus we all recognize today. Rudd and Wright had long been working on the ground effects aero concepts with early evidence seen in tests they ran at BRM in the late 1960s. This caught the attention of Chapman, who was known to be tinkering in his early Lotus aero designs, as evident by his sponsoring of Sean Buckley's undercar aerodynamics research while at Cal Berkeley, also in 1969. Everything would come full circle for Chapman, as he combined Buckley, now a mechanical engineering professor at MIT, with the duo of Rudd and Wright to develop the Lotus 78. So you can understand, after all that effort and work through the late 60s and 70s, why Lotus aerodynamicist Peter Wright felt a slight seeing how close the FW07 resembled the breakthrough designs of the Lotus 79. The FW07 and 08 designs went so far as to even be developed at Imperial College, the same wind tunnel Chapman used. But what Frank Williams had that the Lotus was lacking was the technical modeling advancements Frank Durney brought to the team, a graduate of Imperial College no less. Durney was the first Formula One car designer to develop his work using suspension software he developed himself. This would turn out to be instrumental in the ground effects championships Williams would secure and the later active suspension championships as well. In an interview with Motorsport, he was quoted as saying, I got involved in the FW07 and did all the aerodynamics after that. In fact, from then on, for 10 years until I went to Lotus, there wasn't a single bit of aero on a Williams that I didn't do. The aero department was just me on my own, and so later we got a model maker, and then a technician to run the tunnel. And there, taking the last corner of the last lap, is the world champion of 1982, 
Hickey Rosberg. He knows it. The concepts of the FW07 were evolved into the FW08, which proved to be particularly useful in a very turbulent 1982 season marked by politics, unpredictability, and tragedy. Having only won a single Grand Prix, Keke Rosberg was the first driver since Mike Hawthorne to take the driver's title with a lone win. After the dust settled, 11 different drivers, one of the contested 16 Grand Prix, with 9 straight going to a different driver, and no one scoring P1 more than twice. The chapter closed on the 1982 season, accompanied by the passing of a motorsport legend in Colin Chapman. His legacy of innovation, especially in aerodynamics via ground effects, will always be remembered. The remarkable pace it unleashed to drivers was too great, in fact. Only fitting, ground effects were banned for the 1983 season and the FIA mandated the use of flat under trays for all cars on the grid. The change in regulations in 1983 had Frank replace aero with power. He did this so he could stay close to the field and he started to understand that if you wanted to win and win consistently throughout regulation changes, you needed to partner up with the manufacturer for a good engine. The Cosworth DFV would be replaced by the Honda V6 turbos and make their first appearance in the final GP in South Africa. Chapter 3 return to glory. The Honda years kicked off with the design of the FW09, which would prove to be incredibly unreliable, but the raw speed was there. That 1984 season wasn't pretty, but it wasn't totally worthless. The Honda Power would prove to be one of the quickest, and the Williams Duo were regularly up in the speed trap charts. This outright pace is what lured Nigel Mansell to the team in 1985. Williams clawed their way back to sixth on the grid and to nearly third, tripling their points in the newly branded Yellow Cannon iconic FW10 by the end of the 1985 season. The next two seasons, the Honda engine and the chassis integration would hit its stride, and they were the class of the field thanks to the FW11 which employed the almighty 1.6 V6 turbo. And just as things appeared to be coming together for Williams and Honda, behind the scenes, things began to unravel. One of the major blows to Williams was Frank's motor accident, leaving Paul Ricard after seeing the FW11 test. He sustained a spinal fracture between the fourth and fifth vertebrae, and has been in a wheelchair ever since. This is enough to set any normal person back light years, but it hardly seemed to stop Frank. He was patched into communication with his team while making his recovery, almost as if fighting for his team's life was his chief concern, a fight he would eventually win thanks to the help and support of his family members and close people he trusted. When the dust settled on the 1986 season, Williams notched yet another Constructors' Championship, but in dramatic fashion, they fell just shy of yet another Drivers' Championship thanks to a blown tire in the final stages of the race as Mansell was perfectly positioned for the win. Well, bitter, bitter disappointment for him. He may have been prepared to move over. Hey, look at that! Out that, and colossally, that's Mansell! That is Nigel Mansell! And the car absolutely shattered. He's fighting for control, and you can see what's happened. Mansell is out of the race. Now, this could change and will change the World Championship. Even worse, after Mansell's retirement, this left his teammate in prime position now to take the Drivers' Championship. As a precaution, Piquet came into the pits to protect his tires and switch them out. This put Alain Prost in P1. Thanks to a serendipitous early stop, he was on relatively fresh tires, so he didn't have that same concern. But he did have another problem. He had dangerously low fuel, and he had to protect his position against a fresh-tired Nelson Piquet. Prost was able to hold on to this position and take the 1986 title and his weaker MP4 too. Now, if that sounded exciting and you want to check out all of the action from that race, I've actually made a video about this for you. Check the eye in the top right corner of the screen and also link to it down below in the description. Go ahead and open that video up in a new tab and return to it after this story's conclusion. It's important to call out here, the cracks began to show for the partnership between Williams and Honda. Things began to surface after the lost championship in Adelaide in 1986. Honda were reportedly backing PK as the number one driver, and they had felt that there were times that Mansell could have backed off if told by the team. But despite all the issues that were said to have gone on, Honda still had a championship with Williams, but it seemed that was not enough as the relationship would continue to strain. It did appear, unfortunately, that signs of Frank's absence as he was recovering from his accident did have some effect as Patrick Head took charge of the outfit, but the team would press on and they would make it work for the 87 season, and that Cannon livery would return to the grid in even greater form. Williams would win 9 of the 16 races, and every single Grand Prix that year would have a Williams driver on the podium where both of them finished. Despite PK taking his driver's championship and Williams successfully defending the constructor's title of their own, Honda decided not to supply Williams despite having a year left on the agreement. PK would fill the number one driver slot over at Lotus, as Senna would make his exit to join the legendary duo with Prost at McLaren. But the exit of PK, Honda went too. 
They reportedly wanted to see Nakajima continue his drive, but unfortunately Frank Williams at that time had not really ever capitulated to these sort of commercial requests. Over two seasons, the FW11 was responsible for 18 wins, 16 pulls, 278 points, back-to-back -back constructors championships, and the 1987 double with PK getting his driver's title. This string of highly successful Williams cars that were being designed were thanks to number one of course the very powerful engine, but even more so the active suspension technology that was for more or less borrowed from the Lotus 99T. This was originally inspired by Colin Chapman, so much so that they were actually forced to rebrand the technology implemented in the 87 champion Williams Reactive Ride. The genius in those championship cars was that Williams simplified Chapman's active suspension thanks to Derny's considerable experience with the software he had been working with since the Hesketh 308. The teammates split on their opinions of the active suspension technology on the FW11 with PK fully embracing and Mansell preferring the passive version. PK helped develop the car for better handling. To achieve this, Derny had to hire two individuals to create an electronic system for the simplified active suspension to operate on. With that eye for talent, he would identify the young and bright engineer who was Patty Lowe. But even with the most technologically advanced car, you still need power, and there was no doubt that the Honda engine was capable of delivering. Their sudden departure left Williams without an engine for the 1988 season, so Williams was forced to run the naturally aspirated Judds. To no one's surprise, victory evaded them, and they managed just 20 points as a constructor. They needed an engine, and they needed it to be a good one. Williams made two very smart moves that would start what would be another resurgence for the team. They added Renault Power to the cars, but also formed a successful partnership that would forever change Williams. The brainpower of Adrian Newey. Newey would take the place of the recently opened designer role and fill the very large shoes of Frank Derny. Williams lost Derny to the fact that there was an upward mobility problem. He wanted to be a technical director, but his path was blocked with Patrick Head not going anywhere anytime soon. It's also worth noting that Newey was actually leaving a technical director role to take this designer role. Chapter 4. Top of the Food Chain the Renault Power was a massive step up from the jet engines, of course, but they seemed to be outgunned by the newly mandated naturally aspirated engine restriction, which did away with the turbos. The McLaren team were running on all cylinders, with their stretch of four straight double championships, three of which went to Ayrton. The 1990 season saw a slight drop of performance in a lowly, for them at the time, fourth place. They needed to find a spark on the technical side and switch up the drivers. Their fortunes flipped as Mantle returned to the team after a brief stint at the Scuderia. And as mentioned, the team would also get Adrian Newey over from Leighton House for the 1991 season to work directly under then-technical director Patrick Head. Newey's FW14 clearly was able to rival Senna, but reliability ultimately held them back. Mansoul was two dozen points behind Senna, and the team would finish second only to McLaren by 14 points. The 92 season, built on the success from the previous, gave way to one of the most technologically advanced cars ever to hit the grid. The FW14B, Mansell easily ran the field and set a record at the time for the most wins in a season taking 9 of 16 victories. Mansell's successful run didn't fully secure his seat though as it was rumored that Pearls potentially could wind up at Williams. Senna was even being considered as his contract was up. So when it was confirmed that Prost was indeed a Williams driver, Mansell saw fit to move along. Prost would be joined by Damon Hill for the 1993 season, and he made sure contractually that there was an opt-out clause that said he didn't have to be paired next to Ayrton. It would expire in 1994. Pearl's interest and belief in the Williams car and what it was capable of was correct. It yet again proved to be the class of the field, and his 15C proved to be the title winner as he led another double world championship for Williams. The 15C was so dominant, in fact, the FIA had to step in and ban all driver aids. Much of the power at the core of the 15C was built around items that fell under this umbrella. For Prost, these changes and finding out that Ayrton would be partnering him at Williams for 94, they were enough to see him retire from the sport completely. But for Senna, he was itching to drive a powerful car as Honda had exited the sport, leaving his McLaren drive drastically behind the field. But that regulation change turned to be very important and critical to the performance of Williams. So when they were all banned, it made the FW16 very, very difficult to drive. By all accounts, the 15C from the previous year was already difficult enough to drive. Prost went on to describe it as such. I think that an active suspension car with traction control needs to be thrown around quite a lot, whereas I like to drive a little more quietly, perhaps using the throttle more sensitively, which perhaps is not needed quite as much in an active car. Damon Hill was retained as a supporting driver and Senna immediately became the title favorite for that season. The outright pace was present for the FW16 in 94, but it was a clunky drive and was proving uncharacteristically unreliable. Senna would take each pole he completed that season, but tragically, it wouldn't be many. After taking back-to-back -back poles, 
he was unable to convert any of them into wins. Schumacher's Benetton was able to compensate for being slightly down on power, but more agile and with better race pace. He took the wins in the early part of that season. In the third round of San Marino, there were two fatalities. Ratzenberger was tragically killed in the qualifying session. Some of the front wing got lodged under his car. He would later lose control and hit the wall going 180 miles per hour, or nearly 300 kph. Despite taking pole position, Ayrton seemed more concerned about the safety of the drivers. Ratzenberger's fatal crash resulted in the reintegration of the Grand Prix Drivers Association, where Sterling Moss served as the chairman in 1961. The drivers would plan to bring the group back and Senna offered to take the lead. Unfortunately, he would never be able to carry out the honors. After an early safety car and restart, Senna was attempting to build his lead over the chasing Schumacher. And at Tamburello, he would end up going straight on into a concrete wall that had zero protection at high speeds. My goodness! I just saw him plunge off to the right! What on earth happened there? I don't know! That crash, really that whole weekend, was devastating for F1. There was even another incident where a tire flew off and injured some of the pit crew. San Marino in 94 was full of tragedy. But especially for Frank Williams, who had revered Ayrton as a driver and wanted him to take a driver's title in a Williams car. But sadly, Frank would lose yet another driver he deeply cared about. Details emerged later, an Austrian flag was recovered from the Brazilian's cockpit. It was presumed he would honor Ratzenberger after the race in his first official act as chairman of the reintroduced Grand Prix Drivers Association. To make matters even worse, the Williams team was being pursued in a lengthy trial for manslaughter revolving the details of the death of Ayrton. This would hang over the heads of some members of the team well into the 2000s, being ultimately acquitted in 2005. Out of respect, Williams would retire Hill's car at the next race in Monaco after the first lap. The drivers banded together and took swift action to get safety improvements to the grid. The FAA would immediately respond with a number of different regulations. For the next Grand Prix in Spain, the size of the diffusers would be reduced, the front wing and end plates would be raised, the size of the front wing would be reduced. The idea was to reduce the effects of downforce by a pretty significant margin. Williams would bring on DC to Pear Hill and later they would secure Nigel Mansell to finish out the season at the direction of their engine partner, Renault. All the while, Hill stayed close to Schumacher, and by the time they reached Adelaide, Hill was within a single point of Michael. Schumacher was slightly ahead but made an error and went wide at lap 35. He made slight contact, brushing up just barely against the wall, not enough to stop him completely. Upon re-entry onto the circuit, he put himself on the racing line and naturally was going slow. Hill found an opportunity to safely pass, or so he thought. Schumacher was almost flipped on his side after the two came together when Schumacher turned in. He would retire right then and there. Hill would make it back to the pits, but eventually he would retire with a broken front wishbone. The FAA called it a racing incident, and Michael brought home his first world championship by a single point. But Mansell managed to win the race, and he helped Williams to at least get a constructor's championship that year. So a season marked by tremendous tragedy. At least had some bits of positive news coming out of the final race. In his final race driving for Williams, Nigel would win. Hill would win his home Grand Prix, a feat his father, Graham Hill, never did. But that driver's world championship had still eluded him. For now. And lastly, Williams still took the Constructors' Championship, despite the devastating loss and the tremendous toll this took on the team emotionally. But Michael would take all the momentum from taking that driver's title and carry it over into the 1995 season, now using the Renault RS7 V10, same as Williams. The Benetton could match on power, but the B195 chassis designed by Ross Braun and Rory Byrne was widely considered to be a little bit twitchy. He would still go on to defend his title against Damon Hill, and Benetton would snatch the Constructors' Championship away from Williams. The beauty and the curse of the 1995 season was that the Benetton had clearly figured something out and were able to win with the car at the hands of Michael. So when Michael left to drive at Ferrari, in the short term, it was a sigh of relief as the 95 Scuderia had 14 retirements between the two drivers and only managed 73 points in all. But the bad news was he was taking many of the technical staff over with him, which means a carryover of all that institutional knowledge. Everything that was working at Benetton is now going to work at Ferrari, which we will soon see. Not to mention, right before those championships with Benetton, Braun was smart enough to bring back a familiar name, Frank Durney. He came back to give his input on the aero package and help the team overall. You know, the same guy who modernized the entire aero setup at Williams for both stretches of dominance in the 80s? That guy. And unfortunately for Williams, things would only continue to get worse. Newey's restlessness to return to a technical director role was at an all-time high. That 95 season did not help Newey's cause if the entire plan was to usurp the team's co-founder and longtime standing technical director. But Williams again made their decision and they picked head over Newey. Just to recap, the seven years at Williams under Newey's designs saw 59 races won, that's 52%, 78 poles, which is 68%, 60 fastest laps, which is 53% of the races, four driver's titles, and five constructor's titles. Yeah, they were pretty good. 
the FW18 would be one of the final cars that Nui would have complete input on, and it looked like a rock star with Ferrari essentially having a bit of a rebuild year. Doors wide open for Williams, who had the benefit of an incredibly talented driver lineup. They had the established race winner, in Hill, and the man on fire, Jacques Villeneuve, who had just won the kart championship in the Indy 500 that season prior. According to all accounts of people involved, that season's drive was one of the most smooth that Nui had ever designed. A Williams driver won every single Grand Prix where both drivers finished, apart from one in Belgium. They destroyed the field by taking 12 poles, 12 wins, and scored more than double the points at Ferrari. This is something that many people didn't think could possibly happen today. They thought Damon would drive a cautious race, but he fought. He fought from second on the grid. He passed Jack Villeneuve. He took the lead. He stayed there. And Damon Hill exits the chicane and wins the Japanese Grand Prix. And I've got to stop because I've got a lump in my throat. Despite the success, Williams had seemingly pushed out what was a major asset to the team, and it seemed they had already moved on from the recently crowned Damon Hill. Initial reports came out that Hill had been difficult in negotiations. Over the years, more information trickled out, and reliable reporting suggested a deal to replace Hill was already deeply in motion. As early as the middle of the 1995 season, Hill would actually go on to tell Andrew Benson of then Autosport magazine, I thought it was untrue. I thought it was speculation. So then Frank tells me, yes, it is true. You're not going to be driving for me next year. And for me, it's like, well, bus driver is telling you you've got to get off now. Jacques Villeneuve was paired next to Hill's replacement, Heinz Harold Frentzen. With Newby's design still in place, he had already moved on to McLaren, but the FW19 was more evolution than revolution, so it remained ahead of the field, but Schumacher's Ferrari clearly was light years better. Jacques and HHF both said the car was fairly difficult to drive, which led to the season-long fight down to the wire. Schumacher and Williams were both again embroiled in the center of a controversial title decision, but this time he would be DQ'd for his collision with Villeneuve at Jerez. Schumacher was also unable to continue and was forced to retire in the gravel pit. Villeneuve would actually go on to finish third place and secure a driver's title in his sophomore season in F1. HHF never really felt that comfortable in a Williams, and his 97 drive felt uninspired. He would move on to Jordan and actually have a pretty successful career outperforming that car. The pair, for 1997, had done enough, and they brought the double championship right back to Williams. This is the last time a non-European would win the Formula 1 driver's title. Think about that. This is also the last time Williams would win a championship in either category. Williams would begin what I call not really a downfall, that's more dramatic, pronounced. This is a slow descent from which a vicious cycle of stumbling their way inevitably to the back of the grid. But there was something that set things into motion. The Concord Agreements of 1997. Chapter 5. Bride to Bridesmaid. Over the course of the story so far, Williams has been a team that's been able to compensate for the strategic errors made on the business side or the commercial side. For example, losing an engine deal with no viable backup plan for half-decent power. They've been able to accomplish this thanks to their stellar driver lineups and also their innovation on the aerodynamic front. And buried within their own success was the problem. And if something ever broke, things would go south. There's a reason why I laid this entire piece of content out the way I did. The first half, up until 1997, is going to feel like more of a historical piece on the team. But now, let's really dive into some of the factors that broke the team, in essence. Despite some of the errors they were making on the hiring front, the engine front, the technical front, they were still, as mentioned, able to get those results. They were able to generate that revenue. This revenue, of course, would then lead to engine deals. It would lead to dominant technical aerodynamics. It would lead to dominant drivers. And in turn, those things would lead to points. Those points would attract sponsors, and those sponsors would yield more cash. And after all of those things come together, you get wins. But the second one of these factors breaks, you're exposed. Around the time of these major regulation changes, we got a lot of retirements too. Gone are the Prosts, the Mansells, the PKs, all these drivers that they were able to filter across teams, into their team, and back out again. The Concord Agreement of that year would change dramatically how the teams were compensated. And if you're unfamiliar, the agreements are essentially the governing principles that guide Formula One as an organization and must be agreed to by all of the constructors. It covers a whole host of things like championship rights, commercial agreements, all the way down to regulations. Up until this point, the team shared 85% of the revenue generated by F1. But in the new Concord Agreements of 1997, everything flipped on its head. And by the time everything was said and done, after the agreements were done divvying things up, the teams would now only share a quarter of the revenue from Formula One. Naturally, this is going to affect teams that are smaller, of course, but also it's going to affect teams that are very independent. Those teams are going to be very reliant on the income generated from points, from performance. 
And when you go on to dilute the actual share and size of prize of what those teams are going to get, Williams is now in a situation where they must decide to either aggressively scale, which just isn't in the cards for the team or their ethos, or they just must dominate. Despite the fact that they're going to get less money, they just must win a lot more. The third option technically is they could rely more on commercial dollars, but therein lies the problem. If you don't get performance, commercially, you're not as valuable. The world is totally changing. Marketing's changing. Tobacco money is gone. It's off the table. And now on the innovation factor, Williams has been a major benefactor of being ahead of the curve. They made brilliant hires with Nui, brilliant hires with Derny, having Patrick Head oversee all of that, having Frank seeing the commercial and running the team, all of that worked. But now teams are catching up. Constructors now can have an entire team devoted to aerodynamics. So running a lean organization can work in Formula One if you don't attach yourself to a major constructor, but you need to invest heavily in your technical department it's going to become more and more difficult to find that edge. After driver aids were banned, luckily Williams had Nui there to implement his designs. But when Williams wouldn't offer him his natural progression into a technical director role, which he certainly earned, they lost a lot of institutional knowledge to the competitors. And we all know, of course, about the jackpot that Nui hit with his aerodynamic designs a decade later. The Concord agreements made Formula One a game of margins now. And don't get me wrong, while Patrick Head is a phenomenal technical mind, what always made Williams just a little bit better, they always had the ace in the hole. Now that the landscape is set, let's watch things play out from the 1998 season, Chapter 6, Change in the Tides. Losing their aero advantage, at least Williams still had the Renault power. That is, until they dropped out of Formula 1. Frank was again left holding a lackluster package as he opted for the Mechachrome engines, essentially rebadged Renault engines. The good news was that Williams managed to keep their drivers from the previous championship winning season. But it wouldn't be enough, and McLaren and Ferrari both ran away from Williams, who was forced to settle for third. And this was starting to become an emerging pattern. They had their first win the season since the last time they were unable to secure an engine deal in 1988, and only three podiums. The discarded champion, Damon Hill, was a single point behind Jacques and managed to score a single win, taking Jordan just four points shy of the 1997 double champion. Much of the same followed in 99. Williams had two completely new drivers, though, in Ralf Schumacher and Alessandro Zanardi. Under the hood, they were still forced to be powered by Mechachrome. These were super tech engines. They were debadged RS9 units. The team would have a sharp drop-off in performance, taking only 35 points as a constructor, and Williams ending in fifth place, the worst in a decade. But there was better things on the horizon, and after two seasons of lackluster results, the team secured a long-term engine deal with BMW. Ralph continued to perform fairly well with the setup and was consistently scoring. The promising young rookie, Jensen Button, would get his shot in the 2000 season. The team would improve to third place, but the runners-up in the Constructors' Championship, McLaren, had a staggering four times as many points, and some left over. In 2001, the BMW came to life, almost too much so. The chassis wasn't as strong as the engine, and while the raw pace was starting to show, High downforce tracks were weakness, and so was reliability. Ralph had 7 of 17 retirements, and the newly named driver Juan Pablo Montoya had 11 of 17 retirements. What many don't realize about Montoya is he was originally a Formula driver and was recruited as such. He finished in 5th in British Formula 3, then moved to Formula 3000 where he placed runner-up. That performance got the attention of Williams and he was signed as their test driver in 1998 while also competing for them in Formula 3000. This time though, he'd take the championship, winning 4 of 12 races and on pole 7 times. Knowing the engine change after the 97 season was going to hurt, he made the logical and promotional decision to send over Montoya to the kart series, swapping with Chip Ganassi, which explains why Zanardi was signed in 1999. He came from Ganassi's team after winning back-to-back kart -back titles. But where Zanardi failed to produce results on his reintroduction to F1, Montoya, on the other hand, was brilliant, and he won his rookie season in the series and came in ninth in the second. Fast forward to 2002, and Montoya is back from his cart loan and now in a Formula 1 car. That season was a battle for first loser, as Schumacher set the golden standard of driving that year, while securing the title with six races left in the season. Despite Ralph taking the only win for Williams, Montoya would actually edge him out. The 2003 season would be their best shot at returning to their 90s glory. With Michael in his prime, Montoya was able to mount a stellar title fight for the Williams team, as Ralph also had a very impressive year, the pair splitting the team's four wins. Ultimately, both Raikkonen and Montoya were let down by unfortunate reliability problems, both of them also taking more outright podiums, 9 to Kimi and 10 to Montoya, than the eventual champion, but Michael would double their win count with six wins to their three combined. Raikkonen would go on to take second place behind Michael by two points and ahead of Montoya by nine, thanks to having arguably the fastest car on the grid and the driver's solid performances. The Williams car was able to outscore McLaren by two points to defend their runner-up constructors' honors from 2002. With bright spots giving hope for the 2004 season and armed with one of the best engines on the grid, 
Head would take his first major chance on the walrus nose in an effort to maximize the airflow. In testing, it showed promise, but ultimately it was inconsistent. Failed design would yield one of the last wins Williams would ever see thanks to Montoya's drive at Brazil. Williams would have to settle for fourth, losing out to Ferrari, Barr, and Renault. 2005 marked yet another decline for Williams. This time, though, there wouldn't be a resurgence. In the past, this is where Williams could successfully hide behind some of those things we mentioned before. But now, all they really had for cover was the BMW engine, and it looks like they were losing that too. And the losses would continue, as they would lose Montoya to McLaren and Ralph to Toyota, who was now a works team for the 2005 season. After failing to convert with such a strong engine and such a great driver lineup, they would finally be shaking things up in the technical department. Head moved out of the technical director role to make room for Sam Michael. At the time, the 34-year-old had little more than racing manager connected to his name, but was trusted with the all-important technical director job. After dropping another position in the Constructors' Championship to fifth in the 2005 season, the relationship with BMW began to sour, much like the partnership did with Honda in the 1987 season. This was a booming time for manufacturers to take over teams, as the regulations were proving more difficult to be successful. BMW wanted a slice of that pie, and Frank was having none of it. Despite there being time left on the contract, Williams and BMW dissolved their partnership, and they would then go on to buy Sauber. In another time period, when Williams was winning, they could just grab one of the world champions laying around the grid. And man, do they need a Mansell, a PK, a Rosberg? Keki's time in the grid may be long gone, but Nico's was just getting started. Son of 1982 world champion, Nico Rosberg would join the team fresh off his GP2 title, but even harnessing some of this young talent, it wouldn't make a difference as he would partner Mark Webber. Yet again, Williams would change engine partners, and yet again, they would set some all-time worst in team history record. This time, they failed to score a single podium the entire season between the two drivers and only managed 11 points. The pairing retired the car 20 of a possible 36 times. The only consistent thing for the next few years at Williams would be Rosberg and Sam Michael. And one of those things was clearly not helpful. Rosberg would stick around until the 2010 season. In his four years at Williams, he would drive two different engines and get just as many podiums for a tally of 76 points. Upon his switch to the newly formed Mercedes GP team, he would beat all of the combined totals from his stint at Williams in that very first year alone. From 07 to 09, Williams opted for a fairly decent Toyota engine. They went back to the Cosworth for 2010. Again. Fabrichello and Hulkenberg were picked up only to have Nico replaced the following season by GP2 champ Maldonado. In that 2011 season, the team would set yet another all-time worst in team history record. The duo would only bring home 5 points as a constructor. Changes had to be made. And to be fair, they were, starting with technical. Sam Michael was replaced with Mike Coughlin. And if you subscribe to this channel, that name probably sounds familiar. Well, he was at the center of the Spygate scandal video I made for you. I'll link to that video in the eye in the upper right hand corner. You can open that up in a new tab right now, or just wait till after the video, it'll be down in the description for more binge watching. Prior to Michael's ousting, there was a lot of speculation about what he was going to do in the future of the technical director role as the team became more and more concerned about the lack of development on the cars. Toto Wolff had originally invested in the team in Rosberg's final season, and by 2012, he was named executive director. Before leaving in 2013, after acquiring roughly a third of Mercedes GP, he said the teams have five or six core issues, quote unquote, that need to be addressed, including what he called the human factor. He went on to say that the move, quote, from the founding generation to the next, end quote, had not been a smooth one. While not making a direct statement, he's pretty clearly referring to the changeover from the co-founder of Williams, Sir Patrick Head, to Sam Michael back in 2005. Accompanying this change in technical director meant a change in engines, of course, apparently. At least this time, they're partnering with an engine manufacturer they've had success with. There were no engines that power their surge in performance under Nui's design. And why not? Let's just throw on more change. So we got a change in the directors, a change in the engines, and now a change in the drivers, with Senna, who would replace Barrichello. Coughlin's design that year seemed to have yielded a better engine, and the team were able to improve from 5 to 76 points. It could have been the power of the Renault, but a large chunk of that was Maldonado helping the team get their first win since Montoya in the 2004 Brazil Grand Prix. Times were changing, and more and more of the grid was slowly moving to the customer model. This tightened up the grid, and it made it a lot more difficult to stand out, so those 76 points were good enough for 8th place. As soon as it was here, it was gone. 
Valtteri was promoted to replace Senna for the 2013 season, and Coughlin was on a costly wild goose chase to perfect the exhaust blowing diffusers. Ultimately, it was another technical letdown, and Williams experienced painful deja vu, repeating their dreadful 2011 results, finishing P9 with five points. For the faults, Williams seem to be repeating. In the least, they are taking swift action, spotting that the new formula changes for the turbo hybrid era look to be favoring Mercedes. They sought out an engine deal, but this time with a friend. They had a long-term deal in place to receive the power units from Mercedes. They still had a pretty big problem. They had an aerodynamic issue. After that season, they ended Coughlin's technical experiment. For the past four years, Frank had to watch his former young star designer, Adrian Newey, rise to Formula One glory, achieving what Frank never did, even in their most dominant stretch. Four back-to-back, -back uninterrupted titles. I'm sure this was absolutely bittersweet for him. Chapter 7. The Final Descent a new year and some more changes, but this time it actually was a good thing. Felipe Massa was brought on. Claire Williams, who was Frank's daughter, had recently stepped in as deputy team principal, allowing Frank to step back a bit. The new Mercedes power unit would also mean that there'd be new technical director leadership as Pat Simmons was brought on to replace Mike Coughlin. The tragic irony with that is that they replace one person who was caught up in controversy for the chief architect of the Crashgate scandal of 08. If you're unfamiliar with that story, you know the drill. Eye in the top right corner, also down below. Enjoy. But credit where credit is due, and this was the closest the team had gotten to a real revival. The power unit proved to be the best in class. They were starting to get results again. They returned to the top of the pack on some of these races. Williams seemed to be back to their old ways, getting triple digits in points. They even got a front row lockout in Austria. The changes were promising, and it returned the team to third place, but just as before, Williams failed to find valuable upgrades to the car. As the field around them improved, Williams steadily fell back. The loss of Valtteri in 2017 and Felipe Massa in 2018 started a string of pay drivers that didn't help the situation at all. Williams were firmly planted at the back of the grid. They felt a fresh start was needed, so they decided to replace Pat Simmons with Patty Lowe and signed on Sorokin and Stroll. This new trio of Sorokin, Stroll, and Lowe took them to new, well, Lowe's, no pun intended. Since the team's induction into FOCA in 1979, they had never come in dead last. The team managed to do this two years in a row. Sorokin was dropped and Williams signed George Russell, a member of the Mercedes driver program, for a full-time ride in 2019. Partnering next to Formula One veteran Robert Kubica, the car was a disaster. The lowest total ever reached came in 2019. By this point, Williams fans weren't even really surprised. They had already had such poor seasons and the car wasn't even ready for winter testing that year. It's time to get honest though, and I think if I made this video one year ago, the tone would have been a lot different. As costs go through the roof, it becomes more and more common that teams are finding ways to cut those costs, acting as full-on satellites, buying as much of the non-listed works team parts as regulations will allow. You can see it up and down the paddock. It's most relevant today in Racing Point, for example, or as many call it, the pink Mercedes. And Haas faced some similar criticism as they doubled their points in the 2018 season and shot to fifth place. The fact remains, as Williams sees it, it's a major deal and an incredible honor when they were welcomed into FOCA as a constructor in 1979. Constructor, you know, they build things, they build cars, as they were supposed to, right? To that end, they aren't wrong. With that said, Claire does seem to be showing that they are aware of the shifting climate and will act accordingly. She was quoted this year as saying, We have to be realistic, based on the technical regulations and the complexity of those and the budget we have got as well. To be fair, this isn't on Claire any more than it is on Frank, or the company as a whole for that matter. If anything, it's less on Claire. She's carrying the torch, protecting the legacy of her father and the heart of the historic race team. She has to bear the burden of such a dramatic decision to dilute the Williams name in order to keep the name alive. Now, don't get me wrong, there's a path to creating an agile, lean constructor operation. But saying silly things like, well, Williams has always been independent, they'll remain independent, and it'll work just like it did before. It's not that simple. They've never had this sort of pressure and to this degree. And with what's going on in the world today, everyone's going to have a liquidity problem. And you can bet if you're on razor thin margins, it's only going to be worse. The racing points, the hosses of the grid, they can look upon the boldness it would take to remain steadfast as a chassis constructor model who just relies on outside power, but they'll do it all through the view of their side mirrors. Is it admirable that Williams actually respects the name constructor, making even their own gearboxes? Many might quickly say yes, others certainly no. Me? Well, yeah, I'm old fashioned, so yes, I do think that, but I'm hesitant. Because what is the payoff? What happens if this goes perfectly correct? And you can't bank on regulations bringing the teams closer together. This is a strategy on other teams getting worse, but where's the plan for Williams to get better? I distilled it down to what I thought was three very simple things. 
Number one, institutional technical superiority. This one, they've got the most amount of work to do. Allowing Nui to leave in 1997 in hindsight, I'm sure hurt. I wouldn't doubt Frank does regret the choice in a similar way that he does regret losing BMW in 2006. The technical director appointment in 05 was questionable at best. But even more so, the lack of clear aero focus, that especially has been painful. You can't really learn and grow if you don't set a benchmark and stick to it. There hasn't been enough data, it seems like, to even grow from what, starting from where. Which leads perfectly into the next one, consistency. Even if we toss aside the development of the car and all the issues that changes can have on that, the power structure and the chain of command is vital. And that's one of the things when you look at Williams over a long period of time, even when they do make mistakes, that's what allowed them to see what's working, what's not working, and to adapt, because that's what matters most. Whether up or down, you adapt. Currently at Williams, there's a lot of movement in the aero department, and there's also the vacancy at the technical director role. I actually see that as a good thing. They're taking their time, or they can't find anyone, but either way, they're not rushing to a decision if it's ill-suited. Also, Russell has been a pretty stable voice. He may be gone soon, he may be young, but he is talented, and he has been there, he's been through it all, and he seems to have a good rapport with the team. I would consider two years, unfortunately, consistent for them. And lastly, aerodynamics. I would double down. I would quadruple down on aerodynamics. If Williams refuses to be a B team, fine. But Russell's going to be a one-off. You're not going to get talent like that. And if you can't get the drivers, you need the aero. And for this one, grade A. They are making movements. They're making changes. I don't know how good those changes will be. No one does yet. But they seem, at least on the outset, to be focusing on aerodynamics, which is great news. And that's what I would do if it were my team. But it's not. It's Claire's. It's Frank's. It's Grove's. And before I started this journey, this many months of research that this actually took, I was where many people are, thinking it was some very stubborn thing for Williams to watch their team fade away. But rather than this video be a referendum on Frank, which it most certainly is not, or even on Claire or Williams as a whole, again, is not. I mean, for me, this served as a reminder of what a difficult path it is to F1 success. There are very few teams that have been around longer. Let us not forget, Frank was actually entering cars on the Formula 1 grid in the 60s, right there next to the likes of Bruce McLaren himself. It's easy to look at what's been going on lately, but when you look back, Frank has bet the house and Frank's gotten burned. He's lost not one, but two drivers he's deeply admired. More personally has been taken from him while serving his own company, like his mobility from the chest down after his motor accident. But the enduring spirit of Williams is not the problem, as was proven by the very circumstances for which the team originated under. The fact that Williams is even still here to even have the conversation of mounting a comeback, that's proof enough. They've really just got two options. Will they adapt to the 2022 regulations and even thrive in the shifting dynamics of the inbound formula? It's possible. 2014 was no accident or failing to do what is necessary. We don't have much longer to wait to see how this ends. Williams will be forced to act. How fitting that Frank's first driver was named Courage. And as he lives on to the Frank Williams racing team, let's hope they can evoke a little peers of their own. But lucky for them, Courage is not something that the Williams team lacks. I hope you enjoyed this story. I had a lot of fun making it, but as you can tell, this takes a tremendous amount of resources. So if you did enjoy it, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification if I earned it. It goes a very, very long way in telling YouTube that this is a channel that still has room to grow. And we do. So thanks for hanging out with me. And I'll see you very, very soon. Stop because I've got a lump in my throat.